In the spring of 1974, uh, I got a call from my oldest brother, John Jensen, who was living in Edmonton at the time. He was specializing in aviation law. Um, he got uh, three of us a job, my other brother Jim and first cousin Jack Walker. The job was fishing guides. Um, by the way, we didn't know anything about fishing for Arctic char. Fortunately, you didn't need to know anything. The fish basically caught themselves. I myself was born in Calgary uh, and moved to Mexico in 1970, uh, where I went to uh, middle school. I had just left Mexico and was living with an older sitter, sister in Salt Lake City. And, there, and then from Salt Lake City, we drove to Edmonton and then boarded uh, the company's DC-3. We had to wait a couple of days, however, to receive a safety clearance to fly. Uh, from there, we flew to Yellowknife for a fuel stop and then on to Cambridge Bay for an additional fuel stop and then finally on to the fishing camp. The camp uh, was known as the world's northernmost fishing camp. It lay 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle and further north than Barrows, Alaska. It was in the middle of Victoria Island in the Northwest Territories of Canada. The camp had a gravel airstrip long enough for uh, King Airs and the DC-3 to land. The first week we spent uh, walking the strip and manually removing large rocks. Um, we also spent the first couple of weeks uh, learning how to fish for Arctic char. Um, we went out with a couple of the native Inuits and uh, they taught us the ropes. Arctic char, by the way, remains my absolute favorite tasting fish of all time. Um, the first few weeks in camp was occupied by bird watchers. Uh, they were looking for trumpeter swans, snowy white owls, and uh, countless other birds. We also uh, were fortunate enough to see muskox, arctic fox, and caribou. The camp uh, lay on the edge of a lake. It had a main lodge and individual permanent tents, both for guests and staff. Uh, we had two float planes that uh, were just out front the, the uh, main lodge. Our staff consisted of a number of guides, uh, two pilots, a cook, maintenance staff, and housekeeping. It was all run by a single manager. The owner of the camp, who lived in Edmonton, uh, visited infrequently. However, despite its meager accommodations, we had senators, congressmen, and even royalty from Europe, uh, and others as guests uh, of the lodge. When fishing for Arctic char, we used spoons and trolled behind 14-foot uh, aluminum boats. Uh, each of the lakes that we fished at uh, had a boat set up there uh, waiting for e us each day. Oftentimes when a char would strike, it was so hard uh, that it felt like uh, we had a snag. Um, however, they would immediately stop and the fishermen would think that they'd lost their fish. Uh, we'd explain to them that they had to reel in absolutely as fast as they could, uh, and then off they'd go again. And this would go on for 20, 30 minutes. Uh, I still think it's one of the best sports fish ever. We also fish for lake trout. Um, at midday, we'd pull on to the shore, fire up some briquettes, and cook some fresh char that we had just caught uh, over the grill. And it's just hard to explain the unbelievable fresh flavor of Arctic char on a grill. Uh, some of the Inuit we fished with uh, were made famous by National Geographic magazine. Uh, a special issue uh, highlighted them uh, for their polar bear hunting. Uh, one of them lost both lower legs to frostbite when he was snowmobiling and actually bear hunting. He broke down in the middle of winter storm. Um, and was unable to get back for weeks. This, however, didn't slow him down. Uh, he was just as active as any of the other uh, guides, uh, jumping in and out of boats like uh, nothing happened. Uh, we had two pilots we flew with every day, and one was absolutely incredible. Uh, his name was Martin Hartwell. The other was not so good, uh, so bad in fact, that he managed to destroy a Cessna on an approach to a water landing, coming in too low, hitting the tundra and flipping the aircraft. Fortunately, no one was injured. Um, a helicopter was sent up from Yellowknife to retrieve the aircraft. Uh, it was pretty exciting. A bunch of us guides uh, jumped in the helicopter and rode to the accident site. And then we manually uprighted the aircraft uh, onto the floats. Cables were then attached to the wings of the Cessna and while hovering above the plane, 
Uh, the helicopter was attached to the Cessna and then flown back to Cambridge Bay. After that, we got a new pilot and another Cessna. Martin Hartwell, again, was the best pilot in the company. He made every landing and takeoff just seem effortless. Uh, this was his first job after a harrowing accident and rescue sustained in the fall of 1972 that left him with two broken ankles and a crushed knee and a permanent lip. His left leg being shorter than the right, uh, Hartwell was a 47-year-old immigrant who'd grown up in wartime Germany and learned to fly as a teenager glider pilot in the Luftwaffe. On November 8, 1972, after dropping off some prospectors at a nearby lake, he was planning to fly back to Yellowknife from Cambridge Bay when another flight arrived from Spence Bay with a pregnant uh, Inuit woman and a 14-year-old Inuit boy. Both patients needed to get to Yellowknife and the medical staff urged Hartwell to take them with him. Though Hartwell had some training to fly using only his instruments, uh, he was not an instrument rated pilot. But the nurses were desperate to get the, especially the pregnant Inuit woman to the hospital, fearing that she might die if she were not to go, in, if she were to go into labor. Hartwell agreed to try, even though his pilot's license did not allow him to legally fly with passengers under those conditions. He took off about 3.30 p.m. into a rapidly darkening sky and worsening weather. He had nurse Jer Judy Hill in the back with her two stretcher-bound patients. He never spoke to his pas passengers. At one point, uh, Hill brought Hartwell a cup of coffee but never saw her face. It was a typical winter emergency flight with almost zero visibility. No landmarks uh, in that uh, far north tundra. And the snow of the evening during the night just progressively got worse. Uh, there were 500 nautical miles of frozen tundra and forest to get to Yellowknife. At 7.30 p.m., an ambulance which was waiting at the foot of Yellowknife Control Tower waited. There was no response to radio calls. At 8 p.m., the alert was given. The search would last over three weeks and temperatures raising from minus 20 to minus 40 degrees centigrade. Martin had flown a little in the Luftwaffe towards the end of the war. He had just over 2,000 hours of total flight time, including about 30 hours in the Twin Beach 18, but had only flown in the Canadian Arctic for the last two summers. Again, he had no instrument rating and had little night flight experience. The aircraft had just over six hours of fuel on board and uh, flew at about 140 knots. The plane was not instrument rated either or equipped with the icing equipment. It had only basic EF, uh, VFR navigation instrumentation, a magnetic compass uh, that was of no use so close to the pole. Between Cambridge Bay and Yellowknife, the only navigation aid was a small radio beacon at Contwato Lake. It was so weak that it almost couldn't be picked up until you were right over top of it. Moreover, at night, radio compasses became useless because of electromagnetic disturbances in the upper atmosphere. When Martin's plane had not arrived in Yellowknife and couldn't be reached by radio, a search was initiated that evening on 8 November 1972. A military Hercules began an overnight electronic reconnaissance flight along the planned route. Flying over eight hours, it did several trips between Cambridge Bay and Yellowknife following a parallel route at 30 kilometer intervals. On November 27th, the search was called off after 19 days and 950 flight hours. 200,000 square kilometers of tundra and forest had been searched. The Canadian government had spent about $2 million on the search. Meanwhile, the company that Hartwell worked for, uh, Gateway Aviation, had uh, managed to purchase a new light twin engine airplane uh, with the proceeds from the insurance company, assuming a loss of the uh, Beach 18. Soon after the search was called off, however, his adventure took a spectacular about face. At the insistence of an indigenous organization, friends of Martin Hartwell and the father of his girlfriend, Susan Haley, the search resumed after a few days. And then on December 7th, a military aircraft on a regular flight between 
Inuvik and Yellowknife that was totally unrelated to the search picked up the distress beacon. The Hercules changed course to better determine its origin, however, the signal quickly disappeared again. The following day, two additional Hercules aircraft from the new search team flew in the area of the emergency beacon, completely outside of all previous search areas, but heard no further signals. On the third day, however, December 9th, a Hercules picked up the signal again, sustained for longer this time, and the pilots eventually spotted Martin Hartwell waving a red flare in front of his tent next to the wreckage of his plane. Southeast of Great Bear Lake next to Hotas Lake, 162 nautical miles west of the direct line route from Cambridge Bay to Yellowknife. Another Hercules immediately dropped two Canadian paratroopers in a small near nearby clearing. It took them about an hour wading through the deep snow to reach the wreckage. Martin was the only survivor. Nurse Judy Hill, who was sitting in the co-pilot seat, had been killed on impact. The pregnant Inuit woman died within a few hours after the crash, and the 14-year-old Inuit boy, David, who had some bruises but was not injured. As for Martin Hartwell, both his ankles were broken and his left knee was crushed. Under Martin's direction, David, the 14-year-old Inuit, had built a tent structure with pieces of fir tree and covered it with the tarps used to protect the engines. They had five sleeping bags and board, but only half the rations they were supposed to have. David starved to death after three weeks. He refused to partake in uh, cannibalism. Martin survived from eating the nurse's flesh. As he had a poor understanding of his distress beacon's functioning, he had only acted it, activated it for brief moments and only in the rare occasion when he heard an aircraft in the distance. And this was one of the primary reasons that he was, never, that he was found so late. During the fateful flight, he was unable to receive the very weak Kantwato Lake Beacon and the Yellowknife Beacon was too far distance. He decided to descend from 4,000 feet to 2,300 feet MSL to better pick up the signal. Instead, he should have flown higher. Off course towards his right and close to Great Bear Lake, he hit the top of the only hill in the area. Martin recovered soon after his injuries and rescue. He under, undertook a number of surgeries to break his legs and straighten them back into shape. He got his license back and started flying again less than two years. His first job was working with Arctic outpost camps and with us. Later in Fort Norman um, on the Mackenzie River, west of Great Bear Lake, he started his own flying business. He was well accepted and very well respected by all, especially the indigenous people, as he sometimes took risks to help them when they were stranded in the forest. I now realize that Fort Norman saved Martin's sanity, Haley wrote on her blog in 2015. It was a place where he did not feel the potential of scorn and moral disapproval that came after his very public exposure as a cannibal. And the people protected him. No one ever mentioned it. They all knew, but they kept their own counsel about it. If you enjoyed this video, please press like and also subscribe.